now we're going to contemplate a slightly more complex spectrum. Uh, what we're looking at this time is allyl chloride, which has a double bond, but now we've also introduced this peak over here, and that will change the complex splitting that we observe throughout the spectrum and make things a bit more complex. Uh, once again, before we look at the NMR spectrum, we should contemplate what this should look like in the abstract. Uh, once again, you see that we have a double bond present, and therefore we have three unique peaks on that double bond. Um, we should imagine that they would show up between 5 and 6 parts per million, and they should each be worth one hydrogen. D, of course, we have two hydrogens present, and therefore it should be a 2H peak. We also know that it is next to a chlorine, which should put it in the 2.5 to 3 parts per million range, but it is also next to a double bond, which would put it in a 1.5 to 2 parts per million range. You combine those two thoughts, and you end up thinking that D might show up in the 3 to 4 parts per million range. D has but a single neighbor, so we would expect it to be a doublet. C and B won't be splitting each other, but they will certainly be split by A, thus they would be doublets and doublets. And A should, at the very least, have four J values in it, and therefore, if they're all the same, you would expect it to be a pentet. By now, of course, you realize that since all of these J values won't be identical, it's probably going to be an unholy mess, and that's true. Invariably, if you have a proton that's at an internal double bond position like this, then it ends up looking quite complicated. And I should clarify that I have actually lied. C and B do split each other to a very small extent. Frequently, that splitting is so small that you don't see it and we can ignore it, but sometimes there is, in fact, some splitting here. So, let's recap. If A and B are coupled together and B is not coupled to C, then you'd expect it to be a doublet. If everything works out smoothly, you would expect this to be a doublet, a doublet, a doublet, and a pentet. But of course, what we know is this is going to be a mess. These are going to probably be doublets of doublets, and this is going to be more complicated as well. Nevertheless, strictly using the integrals, we can go ahead and look at the NMR spectrum for this and figure out where A, B, and C are and where D is. Now we are examining the proton NMR spectrum for L chloride, and what you see is some complicated peak worth 1, a doublet worth 1, a doublet worth 1, and what appears to be a doublet worth 2. Therefore, this clearly, as the most complicated single peak in the spectrum, should be A. As the only peak worth 2, this should be D, and these should be B and C in some order. By what I told you with the methyl acrylate, of course, you could say that the larger of the two coupling constants, which is to say the bigger distance gap here, must correspond to the trans relationship, A to B, and the smaller gap here should be the cis relationship, A to C. Therefore, we have already successfully assigned all of these. This is A, this is B, due to the large trans J value, this is C due to the smaller cis J value, and this is D because it's worth 2. Also because the chemical shift is down around 4 parts per million as opposed to being directly bound to a double bond between 5 and 6 parts per million. When we look at uh, NMR spectrum at a moderate level of zoom, you can see that things are well behaved. This is complicated, we knew it would be. These are doublets, this is a doublet, everything behaves fine. However, when you zoom in closer, you may see things that become a bit more complex. While this peak here is certainly a doublet, it contains a doublet splitting in it, we can now see that it is something more complicated. How would you describe that? Well, this is a quartet. This is a quartet. Therefore, this must be a doublet of quartets. There's two quartets contained within this peak. By the same token, this is a doublet of quartets. But if you zoom back out and we just simply look at it at this level, what is it first? It is a doublet. 
this is first and foremost a doublet as well. And this is first and foremost a doublet. If we zoom in, it becomes complicated as well. How would you describe that? Well, it's not a quartet anymore. Why not? Because all four of these lines are roughly equal in intensity. Therefore, it is not a simple quartet. It is instead something really complicated. And let's not worry about that for the moment. This thing that is messy, you might have thought was a pentad at some point, but if we zoom in and look at it closely, it is quite complicated. And it also is one of those extremely complicated couplings that we wouldn't necessarily worry about. So let's zoom back out. Let's focus on B and C for the moment. What do we have here? In both cases, we have a doublet of quartets. So what would give rise to a doublet of quartet pattern? Well, let's once again start by building it out. If we simply have a single proton with no neighbors of any type, it would be a singlet. And in this case, that place would be at 5.35 parts per million. So we have a single line at 5.35 parts per million. If, is, if it is split by a single neighbor, it becomes a doublet. If it is split by two neighbors with the identical J values, then what you have is now a triplet. First the doublet, then the two doublets add together to become a triplet. If it is split by three neighbors identically, then what we end up having is, of course, a quartet. First it becomes a doublet, then it becomes a triplet, and then it all becomes a 1, 3, 3, 1 quartet. 1, 3, 3, 1. So now what happens if before we did this splitting, all with small values into a quartet, we also had one neighbor that split the whole thing pretty far apart, say 17 hertz far apart. Then what you might end up with is a doublet of quartets, where you have a long coupling constant, let's say j equals 17 hertz or so, and you also have several small coupling constants tucked in there. What if those are, say, j equals 1 hertz? Then what you might end up with is a doublet of quartet pattern that clearly resembles what we have there. And what you might end up with here is then a 1 hertz coupling that gives rise to the quartet pattern and the same general idea, but instead of j equals 17 hertz, what you end up with is j equals 10 hertz or so. Is that actually true? Well, if we measure from the middle of this trough of this peak to the middle of the trough of this peak, what do you see? J equals 17 hertz. And if you do the same analysis over here, what do you see? Well, J equals 10 hertz. What about the smaller peak to the smaller peak there? We're on the neighborhood of 1 to 1.2 hertz or thereabouts. So the pattern that you see here 17 hertz and 1 hertz really does describe this peak, set of peaks, and 1 hertz and 10 hertz really does describe this set of peaks. Before this gets too out of hand, we should use uh, ChemDraw to capture some of this information. Peak A, we've looked at and we've decided it's a mess, so I will simply call it a mess, but peak B, we should now call a doublet of quartets, and that is also true for peak C. And peak D, well, let's just call that a mess for the time being. We've also learned that peak B contains a 16.8 hertz coupling as well as a 1.2 hertz coupling. And we've learned that peak C contains a 10-ish hertz coupling as well as a 1.2 hertz coupling. So now let's look at the structure in greater detail here. B. How is it that it is a doublet of quartets? Well, first and foremost, the large coupling has to be due to the trans double bond relationship it has between A and B. In other words, B considers A to be a neighbor with a coupling that is 16.8 hertz. In addition, B clearly considers C and D also to be neighbors, and all three of them have the exact same 1.2 hertz coupling. It is the presence of all three of those neighbors that give rise to the quartet pattern. So it is a doublet of quartets because it has a large 16.8 hertz coupling with A, the doublet part, 
and it has three small 1.2 hertz couplings with D and C, which gives rise to the quartet part. So the big coupling distance here, this energy, is the AB coupling, and the smaller gaps are the BC, BD, and BD couplings. By the same token, of course, what you have in C is it must be considering A to be a neighbor at the energy level of 10.1 hertz, and then at smaller energies, it considers B and D to be its neighbors as well, giving rise to sort of a quartet pattern here. Now we should also note that A clearly must contain a 16.8 hertz coupling and a 10.1 hertz coupling within it if our analysis is so far correct. So if we simply type those in here, we should be able to find them on the spectrum itself. Having zoomed back out on the spectrum, I'm now going to zoom in on what we believe to be A, and we should see what sort of distances we see in this peak. From that peak to that peak right there, what do we have? A 6.5 hertz coupling. To there, we have a 10 hertz coupling. To there, we have a 13 hertz coupling. And to there, we have a 16.6 hertz, cu hertz coupling. So 16.8 is showing up in there. Notice that if you simply go from this first line to the biggest line, what we have is a 16.8 hertz coupling. And if you simply go from this line to this line, what you have is a 10 hertz coupling. So whatever else is true, we can find those two distances in this peak. This peak is complicated, and being able to assign all parts of it is nearly impossible at this stage. But we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that A is coupled to both B and C. What can we say about peak D so far based on the analysis we've done? Whatever else must be true, in peak D, we had better be able to find a 1.2 hertz coupling. And that's because we know that those couplings exist between B and C. So if we go to the spectrum itself and we zoom in and examine the distance between peaks here, sure enough, you see that there is a 1.2, 1.4-ish hertz coupling showing up in this peak in a couple of different places. Therefore, there really is a 1.2 hertz coupling buried in here somewhere. And what's the other coupling that we see, the larger coupling? Well, that's showing up at 6.6 .6 hertz. And I'll remind you that if you examine peak A, that you have a 6.6 .6 hertz coupling showing up in this first distance right there. All of this goes to say that if you should examine this peak and find a 6.6 .6 hertz coupling in D, because it is a neighbor to A, then of course if you look at A, you find as well a 6.6 .6 hertz coupling. So what we're seeing throughout this entire thing is that A is coupled to B with a 16.8 hertz coupling. A is coupled to C with a 10.1 hertz coupling. C, B, and D are all coupled together with a 1.2 hertz coupling. And A and D are coupled together with a 6.6 .6 hertz coupling. So let's zoom back out over here on the NMR spectrum. And I'll remind you that at the first level of analysis, what you see is a mess a doublet, a doublet, and a doublet. We have a mess for sure, and here we definitely have doublet characteristics for B and C, and we do actually have a doublet characteristic, 6.6, .6, here. It's only when we look in closer that we see that this is really a doublet of quartets at that level. We have a doublet of quartets here. We also have a doublet of quartets C, so both of those are showing up as doublet of quartets. And though I don't necessarily want to go into it, you can, in fact, describe the patterns of D and A. It's just that you would characterize this as a 16-line pattern, otherwise known as a doublet of doublet of doublet of doublets. But you can safely ignore that for now. And what we're going to focus on now is simpler stuff, doublets and apparent triplets that we see in salicylic acid and methyl salicylate.